All right, and also big round of applause to all of our sponsors. We would not be able to do this at all if we didn't have the good sponsors that we do. So round of applause for all of them. All right, without further ado, we will move into keynote mode, all right? Um, we've, been extreme, we've been extremely lucky uh, this, this week. We've been extremely lucky this week uh, to have uh, Joe with us. He's been hacking hardware badges with us side by side at night uh, in the hardware labs. Uh, we have a conference before this, this three days at Cisco, and he's been there helping out and, and doing a bunch of cool stuff. So if anybody's interested in hardware security, attacking hardware, Joe's your man to, to talk to about it. Um, he's been at major conferences like uh, Black Hat. So um, I'd like to welcome Joe Fitzpatrick to the stage and talk about the luxury of security. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical. I should be allowed to do my poster. I should be allowed to think. I should be allowed to do my poster. I should be allowed to think. Um. Hi. I really like that song because it's all about, um, you know, speaking your mind, talking about things, so I'm up here to shoot my mouth off and think and glue up some posters about what I think about the luxury of security. I've never done a keynote before, um, which hasn't stopped me from giving other people advice when they've given keynotes, and the advice I give them is usually, it's a keynote, so no matter what you say, people will misinterpret it and construe it to be insightful and me meaningful. So hopefully you guys will, will extend to me that same courtesy. Um, I was pretty excited to come here. This is uh, my second, maybe third time in Tennessee. Um, place I was staying was a little bit like rustic though. I mean, one of the walls was uh, a vinyl tarp and uh, it was pretty crowded, but it was cheap. It was only $4 a night and the company was really good. Um, this is up at Derek Knob Shelter on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, my last time to Tennessee was 12 years ago when I through hiked the Appalachian Trail and got to visit the wonders of Gatlinburg uh, and Irwin. Um, so, who am I and why am I here? Um, I'm an electrical engineer. You can notice the spelling. That's really important because apparently in Oregon you need to be licensed to be an engineer. And I don't have a license, so I'm just an engineer. Um, <laughs> I've spent about 10 years playing with hardware professionally. I did silicon debug. I did security research um, for Intel for eight years. Well, I worked at Intel for eight years, part of which was security research and pen testing of CPUs. Since then, I've focused on security training. I teach classes, uh, physical attacks on embedded systems, physical attacks, and hardware pen testing. I also own a pair of white shoes that are full of LEDs. You can't really make out the LEDs here, but I was pretty excited to, to get those and wear those uh, recently. Um, so first, what was your first computer? Um, how many of you, your first computer mm, had an LCD screen? Okay. How many of you had a, your first computer didn't have a screen, yeah. right? Okay, how many of you, your first computer had a touch screen? No one's raising their hand, but there are these people around who were born recently who may have <laughs> like woken up into the world where computers had touch screens. I remember um, in the 90s, I, I, I realized one day like, wow, people born this decade have never played 2D video games. Like all the consoles are 3D, like wow. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start out with a little bit of history of computing progress. And this is really important because um, when we talk about security as a luxury, we need to look at like, what, what the baseline is. Where did we come from? Why is what we have now uh, so great or so limited? So we go way, way back. Anybody know who this is? Ada Lovelace. Whoever, who answered first? Because I have a mug for you. Where are you? Right there. You, Besides Knoxville mug. Okay, Ada Lovelace, it's kind of a little hard to see because the spotlight's on her, but uh, she uh, worked with Charles Babbage and uh, kind of invented a lot of stuff, came up with the concept of programming language uh, for a computer that was never built. But the point is, uh, we started a long time ago thinking about these things, and it was a, a long time, 100 years before we had actual computers. Um, come the 40s, we had um, ENIAC, or you know, ENIAC. Um, which this generation of computers were based on vacuum tubes. They were switches. Uh, they were ones and zeros that turned on and off. You gave it input, you got an output. Really, when we think about this stage of computing, they were glorified calculators. 
right? They didn't really run programs in the sense that we think of them now. You wired them up to do the calculation you want, you put input in and you got in output out. Um, this is also long before we reached gender parity in programming. Because um, actually, like, it used to be the programmers were all women. The c computers was a person, the, and, and then most of the people who were computers were women. Uh, but anyway, um, onward to the 50s. Um, we had some innovations that made computers change dramatically. Um, this is Seek, um, and what she's working on was actually called Haystack. It was this, this, this program that would go and search chemistry liter literature, um, which would help people who were doing chemistry research to find references to things they were working on. So like, wow, okay, this is 70 years ago, and we're already thinking about using computers to do stuff other than just math. We're searching. This is pretty great. Um, but there were still some really major limitations. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody recognize these? This is a mercury delay line memory, okay? So we didn't have memory, right, on computers back in those days. You had to get this big thing that was filled with mercury, and you had to have an electrical signal vibrate it. And the vibration would travel through the mercury very slowly, because mercury is a very thick liquid, to the other end. And I can't recall if it bounces back or the receiver's on the other end. It bounces back. And some milliseconds later, you get that same piece of data back. OK? Well, this is memory, right? We are putting information in, and we're retrieving it later. The only problem is we have to retrieve it at exactly the right time, or we don't get the right data back. So you got to keep track of all that. I don't know how they did that without like memory to store of, like the lookup table, but whatever. It's interesting when you think about it, electrical propagation delay. So it, this used sound traveling or vibrations traveling through mercury. If we were talking about electrical, right, electri electricity runs really fast. Propagation delay is about uh, one nan nanosecond for every six inches. If you think about an HDMI 2 cable, that's 18 gigabit per seconds of data going through that cable. And that means you have 36 bits of data per foot, right, inside your HDMI cable. If you had 45 miles of HDMI cable, you would theoretically have four, one megabyte of memory. Like, think about this, right? It's strange. Um, obviously, things didn't run at four, uh, 18 gigabit per second back in the 50s. Um, what happened in the 50s, though, we also had another innovation. Who knows what this is? Core memory. Core memory. I don't know where that came from, but here's two no starch buttons. Let's see if I can get it up to the top. People on the bottom, cover your eyes. Oh, next time. OK. So core memory, we had these little pieces of metal that had wires running through them. And if we, we, we pulsed the right wires in the right combination, we could change the polarity of these, uh, these blocks of metal. And then we would read them and get our data back. So this is a lot more efficient than having to sit there and wait for your echoes to come back at the other end of a tube of mercury. It's also slight, less slightly more environmentally friendly, I believe. Um, so moving onward, we come to the 60s. We get to like the stage where computers become a bit more commercial. We have uh, an IBM System 360, which was kind of iconic in uh, what you've got for computers of the era. Um, you know, what's also interesting is you know, these computers, were, this is the era when we started having uh, integrated circuits and transistors. Um, what happened first is instead, oh, and Anybody who know who that is? Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper. I'm going to throw another button, not necessarily to the person who said that, but. Yeah. I can't actually see anything, and I can't throw either. Um, but let's keep that secret. Don't tell anyone. So this is a NOR gate. This is a NOR gate on an integrated circuit, and this is register transistor, uh, sorry, yeah, resistor transistor logic. Right? We're like, OK, we're going to get one transistor, put a bunch of resistors around it, and we're going to make a, a NOR gate. So a NOR gate is pretty basic. Like, it's pretty simple. It's two wires input, one wire output, and you get some logic happening. Um, this is one that was used in the Apollo program. Um, the Apollo program used RTL logic, which was very quickly outdated with transistor transistor logic, TTL logic, because when you go to this level of integration, right, whether you make a resistor or you make a transistor, it's the same. When you had to build discrete components, transistors were expensive, resistors were cheap. So there's this trend that pops up. When you, once you integrate something into silicon, suddenly it becomes free, at least if you're a manufacturer of silicon. Um, so we'll see that happen through time as we add more and more features to our computers. Um, uh, yeah, another button. Who's this? 
Yeah, come on. She wrote, this is, this is the code that ran the Apollo program. Margaret Hamilton. So um, how many of you have printed out code? Like how many of you have finished a project and printed out the whole stack of source code to archive it? Oh, oh it's, it's getting closer, getting closer. I made the first one up there. Dive for it, don't fall over the railing. Um, how many of you actually had, have coded with a line printer? Okay, so yeah, sometimes the, the output was not just the final output, you actually were developing on a line printer or in your head. Um, so uh, this is uh, the Apollo code from 1969, I believe that pro the photo was probably taken in the 70s, but what? Oh, no, I don't have another slide for the 60s. Um, oh yeah, we did, we just finished the 60s. Uh, sorry, let me go back and forth. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. Don't, don't, don't peek ahead. So, 70s, this was kind of like really cool. Who's, whose first computer was in the 70s? Couple people. If I had been alive, my first computer probably would have been in the 70s. Um, this was pretty cool. This is where we had kits for computers. This is where we had home computers for the first time. Um, everything before this was giant, expensive stuff. If you got a chance to work on a computer, you were at a school, you were at a company, you were in the government somewhere. But now you can get an Altair, uh, you can get an Apple computer, uh, which you had to make your own box for. Um, the Altair you actually had to put together yourself, um, which really changed things. And what changed this, what made this possible, is we suddenly had integrated circuits that were entire CPUs. Um, so this is the 4004 CPU. This is a picture of it. And you can see gates in this, which is pretty crazy, because this isn't very high resolution. So you remember that NOR gate we saw before? Imagine thousands of them all together, and suddenly we have something that does math and registers and all that stuff. Um, what's also really interesting is uh, something I'm not remembering, but whatever. Um, so 4004, 8008, and then the 8086 ended up inside the IBM PC. So who owned an IBM PC? Okay, yeah, so 80s was the time where you could go to the store and buy a home computer and it would do great things like um, you know, very basic word processing, and there was probably a program on there that showed off databases, so you could store all your recipes. Who uses a database for their recipes right now? Okay. <laughs> where, where are you, up there? Okay. I'll throw an, I'll hit someone else. Oh, no. <laughs> the pins are closed. The, the sharp point isn't sticking out when I throw them. So, my own PC, my own IBM computer, imagine that. Um, this is pretty cool. Where did I put my, my remote? Here we go. I'm powerless without my, my remote. Um, so this is the motherboard from an old IBM PC, the original IBM PC. There's a lot of chips on there, right? These are the days where if you want to upgrade your memory, you actually bought memory chips instead of modules. Um, you had some expansion slots. Um, where is the 8088? Is this it? I think that's it. Um, the, the, the actual CPU, which kind of is funny because it doesn't really stand out from anything else, whereas if you look inside a PC today, the CPU is massive and everything else is just uh, passives. Um, by the end of the 80s, the 486 was released, and this is what a, a common motherboard looked like, right? You have a massive CPU, you have lots of spots for expansion, you have memory on modules, right? You have some other stuff in socketed chips, but uh, and you know, usually some glue logic that puts it together that's all integrated into one chip, right? What we used to do with discrete chips that would have wires connecting them all together to do logic, you can suddenly put into a single chip, which is pretty awesome. Um, and that's what made computers smaller, that would make made them easier, that would, that's what made them so we had them at home and tried to do sketchy things like hook them up to phone lines and talk to our friends or talk to random strangers that we pretended were our friends. Um, <laughs> before years later we could actually friend them on social media. Um, then we move on to like when history began. <laughs> no. So the 1990s was a big deal. Um, even though the 486 came out, uh, the 386 and the 46 came out in the 80s, um, not many operating systems actually used the features of it uh, fully. So does anybody know what, what, what operating system came out in 1995 that was pivotal? and like changed the world? OS2. Anybody know what this is? Anybody? Version 1.0 was released in 1995. Linux, 
Linux version 1.0 was reached in, uh, uh, badge interference. <laughs> I keep trying for the top, so. Um, so suddenly we have, we have powerful operating systems that are doing things like using protected mode to isolate processes. So is process isolation a security feature? Was it in, intended to be a security feature? It's intended to be a way for us to isolate processes so if calculator crashes, it doesn't also crash our word processor. Um, if Minesweeper crashes, you know, it doesn't also cl crash uh, Solitaire, right? The purpose is, is to prevent uh, errant processes, um, uh, poorly operating processes from affecting each other. At the time, things like this were not designed to protect malicious processes from attacking other malicious processes. So we had isolated memory regions, we have task state structures that we can swap between different devices. We can use our computers in very different ways than we used before, um, but you know, we still haven't really got security figured out. Um, and 90s, in, in my recollection, seems to be like the time when, when hacking got really interesting, right? Instead of having to dial up to, you know, war dialing numbers to find like a, you know, some government or corporate computer to go and grab things off of and play games like Global Thermonuclear War, we could get on the internet and you know, find those same games sometimes. Um, we had connectivity to other things. We started to see this dot com uh, boom, bubble, bust, whatever you want to call it, start happening where we could do cool things like buy plane tickets online and buy dog food and buy more dog food and buy dog food at a loss, <laughs> um, at, at a loss to the seller. Um, so this is the Pentium microarchitecture. This is not the best diagram that I was able to find, but the one I was able to find quickly. Um, what was interesting about the Pentium is if you took two 486s and squashed them together, you essentially got a Pentium, right? You had two separate pipelines that are broken up here, um, the U pipeline and the Y pipeline. So you could, you could run an instruction, and if the next instruction in memory was a certain category of instruction that didn't depend on the first one, you could start that immediately, right? So you could do two things at once, which is pretty crazy. Um, by the end of the 90s, we were dealing with a, a Pentium Pro, Pentium 2, Pentium 3 era core, which gets really wide. Um, and this is actually a core 2 architecture, which is uh, only like five or eight years old. Um, but it's actually the same microarchitecture underneath. You have this like reorder buffer that puts all your instructions in a, a more optimal order. So no matter what the programmer was thinking, no matter what that silly compiler was thinking, you can actually like find more efficiencies later on. And you have several different pipelines to do all different instructions at the same time, and then you shuffle them back into order at the end. This is pretty crazy, because like, we're getting to the point where like, performance is not limited by you, your code, your compiler. Um, you can have layers upon layers of ways where you increase the performance of the stuff that you're doing. Um, and actually, I already mentioned this. We've got address spaces, so uh, physical address versus virtual address. Basically, we have a scenario where we have one program that sees memory, and we have a mechanism to prevent that program from seeing certain spaces in memory. Like I said, this is a functionality, this is an enhancement. From the beginning, it wasn't necessarily considered a security feature like we would think of it today, but over time, it's gotten hardened, hardened pretty well. Um, we could prevent a bad process from messing up other somewhat properly behaving processes. We move on to uh, the, the naughties, as I've heard them called outside the US, because zero is not, and I think that the naughties is a really good name. Um, so I think in my recollection, the most important thing that came out of the, the, the naughties is virtualization, right? So we have virtualization um, that you can use in two different scenarios, right? Instead of having to run your operating system on your PC, um, and run your you know, malware on it to test it, right? You can virtualize it, you can put it into a container, and this is a hardware cons assisted container. You can have a scenario where you have your host operating system and you throw in a couple guest operating systems. You can also have a, a different layer where you have a virtual machine monitor that sits underneath everything, and this might be your super trusted code, and then you can run all your less trusted VMs on top of it. Um, and again, we, we have this scenario, we have hardware protections, we have hardware assisted features, we can suddenly do lots of stuff. But again, the reason we did this is not for security. We did this because people wanted to run a mail server and a SQL server and a web server on one box and maybe move them around and not have to buy three separate servers. Um, so we have these functional requirements that are still dictating the things we do and the security benefits tend to be additional. Um, there's also another neat feature. You know, we actually got 
virtualization as consumers in the 90s. We actually got operating systems and you know, tools that supported it decently. Not great like they are, not as great as they are today, but decently. Um, we also got I.O. virtualization as well. This is great out of one of Intel's slides. Basically, you think of normally you have your VMM, your virtual machine monitor, and your virtual machines that sit on top of it. If you want to do anything to hardware, you have to go through a layer of emulation or a layer of abstraction or a layer of like wrapper driver. With an IOMMU, you basically can assign device one to virtual machine one, device two to virtual machine two, and you can sit there and you can have one computer with three graphics cards and three guest operating systems. Each one of them is using native graphics card drivers, and each graphics card thinks it's native to that operating system, which is pretty crazy, pretty cool, and actually turns out to be a really neat security feature when you're dealing with DMA attacks. You can ask me about that later if you're curious about those. Um, the downside is nobody actually used it for quite a while, um, at least not in the noughties. Um, where are we now? The cloud. That deserves a pin. I'm gonna throw it. Cover your eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry, should I stop doing this? No, okay. So cloud computing nirvana, all your data anywhere, anytime, for anyone who can convince the computer that they're you. Um, this sounds pretty great. Um, we're at the point where we have uh, mobile devices, laptops, and servers that are backing the cloud um, that have their own computation capabilities. We have virtualization, so you know, 20 of us can share one server to do our, our backend stuff, or maybe our, our hash cracking, or whatever it is that we do that requires computation, or our graphics rendering. Um, and we don't have to sit there with our laptop that has all of that compute capability. Um, yeah, I like this. Um, what the bleep is this bleep, Brian Barbie asked while looking at the DVD he handed her. Have you ever heard of GitHub? It's how we share code in 2014. Damn it, my laptop doesn't even have a DVD drive. Okay, this is where we are right now. Um, and this is graciously stolen uh, from Twitter uh, from a modified version of the Barbie computer engineer uh, book. Um, the modified ones are so much better than the original. Um, but yeah, this is where we're at. We have this mobile device, this is our, in our connection to the world. Um, we put everything on it, and we store stuff somewhere on shared resources that we can kind of trust that belong to just us. So our needs for security changed dramatically from the 80s, when we didn't have anything connected, to the 90s, where we started throwing stuff on the internet because we could, which we continue to do today, uh, to, to the noughties, where we start thinking about this and adding features that help us manage it, to now, where who knows what's what, where, where it is, who owns it, what jurisdiction it is in, and everything else. So this is a MacBook Pro 13-inch Retina performance for like the past four years of models. And what I notice when I see this is like the lowest end one is 25 something, uh, 2,500 Geekbench 3 single core score. The fastest one is 3,200, right? The point is, there's not a lot of difference here. We're going through generations and generations of products, and I chose MacBooks because they kind of have a lot more homogeneity to their series and their progression than every other manufacturer um, in the world. Um, but what is interesting is if we look over time, this is uh, from Hennessy and Patterson, so it's slightly a couple years old. We look at improvements in uh, prof processor performance, right? Back in the 70s, we had 25% a year, but between the 80s and the early 90s, we had 52% a year, which is crazy increase in performance. But now it's leveling out, only 20% per year. So, you know, there, there are some arguments that this is a physical constraint, like we're no longer, we don't longer have the uh, technical capacity to push circuitry that far. You know, the whole Moore's law is starting to die. Um, on the other hand, we are in a weird situation where we don't always need this performance, right? When it comes to our laptops, like how many of you have a quad-core laptop? How many of you have a dual-core laptop? How many of you aren't really sure? How many of you, like, really don't care? Right? I mean, there are rare scenarios where I think, like, oh, I wish I had a quad-core laptop so this compiling will happen in 30 seconds instead of 45. That's a very different concern be, be, be against like, oh, I should have bought a ladder, bigger laptop with more RAM so that I could open two tabs in my web, web browser at once, right? So 
We talked a lot about history of computing. Let's kind of flip sides a little bit more. Who here has studied economics? Okay. Amateur economics? Okay, good. That's kind of my, actually that's beyond my level. But uh, who's heard of post-scarcity? So we have like supply and demand curves and we say, okay, when supply decreases, right, cost goes up. When demand increases, cost goes up. These two things are plotted with curves and the intersection is like the market price, okay? When we talk about computation, our supply, our available supply of computation is going up and up and up and up. And it used to be for 50 years that our demand followed it, right? Um, is it following anymore? I'm not sure. Um, and let's think a little bit more about this. So there's, I have a couple quotes. Um, the free development of individualities and hence not the reduction of necessary labor time so as to posit surplus labor, but rather to the general reduction of the necessary labor to, of society to a minimum which then corresponds to the artistic, scientific, et cetera, development of all the individuals in the time set free and the means created for all of them. So basically the idea is we're going to get to the point where we have everything we need and we'll have the time to go and do the things we want to do. You know, pursue art, science, research, fun, security conferences, beer brewing, everything like that. You know, that's kind of communist talk, isn't it, though, right? So uh, I thought more relevant is, and I took both of these from Wikipedia for all you other amateur economics people. Uh, in the long run, making programs free is a step towards a post-scarcity world where nobody will have to work very hard just to make a living. People will be free to devote themselves to activities that are fun, such as programming. Uh, after spending the necessary 10 hours a week on required tasks such as legislation, family counseling, robot repair, and asteroid prospecting, there will be no need to be able to make a living from programming. Um, this is also interesting because it's a little more technical, but perhaps you might also have the opinion. Uh, Richard Stallman. Uh, maybe this is more, more communist speak, whatever. Um, it's interesting, like, it makes sense. P open source gives us the ability to leverage all the work everyone else has done so we don't have to do it over again. Like, think of everything we have in this current, like, tech, you know, startup culture, whatever is going on. You're building layers upon layers of software that are open source and you're throwing, you know, a fancy app on top and making millions of dollars. It's a pretty neat field. I wish I were doing that. Uh, no, actually, I don't. <laughs> So back to post-scarcity, right? So as our computation ability increases, as our spare cycles, as our extra performance uh, exceeds what we need, this is the point in time where we look for the next thing to do, okay? So another tangent, how about psychology? Who's an amateur psychologist in here? Who pretends to be on the internet? On internet forums, maybe? Okay, so who knows this thing? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, did I make it? No, I didn't. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just going for the aisle so I don't poke eyes or anything out. Frisbee. 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 Maybe. We'll think, I'll think about that. Right. So we have layers, right? At the, at the core, what we need, we need physiological needs, food, water, shelter, warmth, right? Uh, once those are met, that's the only point in time we can move on and go on to safety, okay? Well, now that I can eat and I'm not worried about starving to death, maybe it'd be nice to like not cower in fear of you know whatever's happening, you know the the local fiefdom that's gonna you know take everything from me. On top of that, once you once you like have the the free mind to actually like think about communicating with other people, you have this need for belonging. Um, when you belong to a community, whether it is a you know local security community, whether it is a family, whether it is a company that really loves you as long as you work for them. Um, in their interest. Um, you kind of move on to self-esteem, like achievement, mastery, recognition of respect. Um, this is pretty neat, like, you know, suddenly you don't have to worry about food or safety or belonging, or in certain cases you do, but whatever. But you get to the point where you, you can concentrate on what your skills are, what you're good at, um, and what you need to do to make everything work. And finally, you know, self-actualization, maybe this is like the pinnacle and yeah, whatever. And how many of you have seen this uh, alteration to this? Yeah, whatever. So I don't know if Wi-Fi really belongs at the bottom. Like I would really choose food and beer over Wi-Fi. Who here would agree with that? Okay, because I mean, when it comes down to a good conference, right? If you don't have Wi-Fi, you're gonna be forced to like belong to the group that you're around and talk to them and, and drink beer with them and eat food. So, you know, maybe Wi-Fi belongs somewhere up here. Um, but another thing we should, we should mention while we're on it, like, who, who's got drink tickets left? Okay, 
So remember, like physiological, that's food, water, shelter, warmth, right? And we've got to take care of that. So when you've got a drink ticket, right, appropriate tipping belongs there, right? When you, when you redeem your, your drink ticket for your drink, you know, tip, tip your bartender. And that will help you with the physiological level. And it also means it'll help you with belonging and being loved and just being happy. And maybe someday you'll reach self-actualization through tipping. But back to the point. Um, where do computers fit in this? We mentioned Wi-Fi, but like, can we self-actualize without a, a computer? Can we self-actualize without an app that will self-actualize for us? Um, I don't know because we're still, new, we're still new in this realm and maybe all the self-actualization that happened before computers was just imaginary and we're really onto something now. Um, but I think we've got a hierarchy of computing needs, right? And we can see through the time, through the timeline that we walked through, that we're building up capability. We're building up capability until we get to the very top where we actually have the leeway, the time, and actually the need to worry about security. Um, so at the core functionality, we wanted a machine that was Turing complete. That was a big deal. Who, who still like, goes on the internet and argues about CISC versus RISC? Because, I mean, that's kind of a dead argument. Who, who won? Yeah, both? I don't know. Neither? Um, does it matter? No, because we're at the point it doesn't matter. Um, we have cool things like hardware acceleration of floating point, and we have hardware acceleration of cryptographic processes, and we have all sorts of neat stuff. So our functionality foundation is actually really good right now. Doesn't mean we should trust it completely, but it's pretty solid. Then we move on to performance. Like, okay, we can do math, but can we do math faster than a human could? Yeah. Um, can we do math that's economical in terms of the space the computer takes up? Um, how many rooms does it take up? How much air conditioning does it need? Excuse me. Or um, how much does it cost and how much can I fit in my pocket or how, much will, how long will my battery last? Um, these are all really performance metrics in some way, shape, or form. And again, usability. We started with line printers. We got some keyboards and then screens so we didn't have to waste all that paper. Um, command line interfaces that were interactive instead of just huge batch commands that we ran and came back uh, a couple days later when our turn had come to run them. Um, mice that give us the ability to interact with GUIs and which those are finally replaced with you know, touch screen interfaces. And somewhere in there, someone may have thought about user experience and maybe someone listened to them. I hope that happens a lot more often these days, but whatever. I categorize that as usability. When we've got computers that people start to use, we need to think about the long-term effects of them. Um, can we trust them to do the job that we're buying them and using them to do, um, what's the mean time between failure? We can't imagine that like these computers will never fail. They will fail eventually, but what do we do about that? We have software exception handling. We have hardware exception handling. Um, how many of you um, trust the memory in your computer? I mean, to the mo for the most part you do, but how many of you have ECC memory in your computer that you use on a daily basis? Very few of you. Um, this is really interesting to me because this seems like one of those things like, you know, we have a small bit of overhead, right? We all have like gigabytes more memory than we need unless you're buying one of those $10, you know, $100 Windows tablets that only come with one gigabyte of memory. But most of us have plenty of memory. Really, the overhead of ECC is a small percentage and the reliability that comes out of that is amazing. And also RAID storage, re redundant storage um, is all things that improve the reliability of our systems. And lastly, we've got connectivity. I'm building these up in a ladder and there's definitely some interplay between the different layers, but I think that these are the, the order that things become really important. So we've got connectivity. We can put these uh, online be, by talking to each other via modems. We can go and use like an online service. Uh, through through dial-up, we have um, cable internet, fiber internet, Wi-Fi, 4G, all these things. And we're getting to the point where we have high bandwidth, low latency, uh, omnipresent uh, everywhere connectivity, which is really cool. Um, and that's giving us the room to innovate in the realm of security, right? We have things like virtual memory, which may or may not have started as a, uh, as a security feature, but essentially it is at this point. We have data execution prevention, ASLR, uh, virtualization. We have systems that have hardware random number generators, right? Who would have thought such a simple thing put into the hardware would be so wonderful, uh, despite the fact that there are still people who won't use a hardware random number generator because they can't trust it. Um, so trade-offs. Uh, we do have some security, but we have trade-offs in every one of those things. I'm not really sure what fits at the top of the, the thing. I left an empty spot because I don't think we're there yet. We don't know what it is, um, but it reminded me that like, maybe there's like, something. 
Maybe that's the cloud. I don't know. So here we are. We've built up uh, quite a bit of things. We've got computers that work. We've got computers that we enjoy using, maybe. Um, and they do great things for us, but it's still not perfect. Um, what about different industries, right? I've been talking mostly about desktop and server C PCs because that's really my personal experience. And most of us, that's what we work with on a daily basis. But what about industrial control systems, right? They have a different set of requirements. They need some core functionality and they need reliability, right? They don't care about usability. I mean, they kind of do, but have you ever seen an interface, uh, like a human machine interface on an ICS system? Yeah. Um, performance doesn't really matter, right? And it really can't matter because when you install an industrial control system, you're expecting it to, to last for decades, like 30 to 50 years in some cases. So you don't want to chase the performance that's coming out next year to make and implement a system that's going to be around for 50 years. Um, Connectivity has come late in the game to that. Um, there's, there's a big problem where people take these old systems and they say, oh, well, I wanna, I wanna control the water treatment plant from the internet, so I'll just put uh, uh, VNC on here, and we're good, and we'll plug it into the internet. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we're, we're learning here, but we haven't built the full stack in that realm, so we aren't thinking in the mindset, and we don't have the luxury of thinking in that mindset. Uh, what about IoT? Right? What do you need to like, have a successful IoT startup? You need to have something, actually I should probably cross out functionality. You need to have a demo <laughs> and it needs to be online. Right? And if you've got those two things, then you've got venture capitalists all over you like, oh wow, we want to turn this, we want, we've got millions of dollars for you. Um, but really, like, that's what it takes to make an IoT device. And these IoT devices are small systems. Sometimes they're battery powered, sometimes they're just compact and they don't have the luxury of unlimited compute performance. They don't have the luxury of spending an extra 50 cents to buy a CPU that has a hardware random number generator in them because you're, they're being sold for 10, 5, 20 dollars and there is no margin, right? Um, and no one cares about the hardware anyway because they're all selling the services that are tied to the cloud. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna fill in the blanks here. Like I see IoT and there's a lot of people who talk about like, oh, IoT, it's like going back to the 90s. Well, it is, right? Because we're in a realm that we're working on a platform that hasn't built up the layers that we have in, in mainstream computing right now. Medical devices are a lot like, um, what's it called? Um, ICS systems, same, same combination. We need to have something that works and is reliable because I would hate to have a, a lethal dose of insulin injected into me if I were wearing an insulin pump. And these are interesting because usability comes up a lot more than it does with ICS, right? Uh, you have to be able to use it. You have to have a, a normal person know how to use their, their medical implant, their medical device uh, to make it work. And I think we, we have this mistake that uh, IoT sees that like, oh, usability means it's online. Um, so again, we'll get to the point where what we have now in IoT devices might be like microcontrollers, it might be microcontrollers with mask ROMs. Sometimes they're a little bit more advanced and they have like full stack operating systems, which increases complexity without really increasing reliability. Um, but at some point in time, I believe we'll get to the point where we have the spare computation, we have the spare time, we have the powerful programming languages, that means our developers have the time to worry about security as opposed to worrying about FCC or FCC, uh, FDA certification or something like that. Mobile devices, we've all got one. Um, functionality, usability, and connectivity. Those are the great things about mobile devices. If it wasn't usable, no one would have them, right? The whole, the whole change that I see in mobile devices, once the, once the iPhone came out and had a touch screen, right, suddenly everybody wanted one because using a, a stylus was just silly and you looked like a dork. And we're all concerned about looking like dorks here, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Sergey Bratis often cites Wright's principle. Um, he says, security does not improve until practical tools for exploration of the attack surface are made available, right? It's not until we have the tools that we can go and attack uh, Wi-Fi or net Ethernet or anything else or software with fuzzing tools that we can actually understand the attack surface and, and what's possible on that. Um, Bratis's corollary, it's not what he calls it, but it's what I will. Um, a buster component that doesn't come with tools for practical injection of crafted inputs and states should be considered insecure. The longer it misses such tools, the more so. This makes sense. If we're gonna make a device, if we're gonna make a tool, if we're gonna make a protocol, if we're gonna make an interface, we should have a plan for how we're going to attack it. 
There's a dilemma though, right? There's what I consider a precursor to rights principle, right? An implementation of the attack surface must exist before the exploration tools can be considered both practical and complete, right? You can make an attack tool that attacks with theoretical hardware against a theoretical interface based on the specification, and that's great. And that's gonna tell you a lot about the specification, but that's not gonna tell you anything about what's actually happening in the real world. You have to wait till someone develops something, produces it, and then you can attack it. This was a dilemma I encountered a lot when I was doing CPU validation, right? Uh, when, you, when you buy a CPU um, or a system with a CPU in it, that CPU has been around for quite a while in validation. It's being very intensively uh, functionality checked, but we also need to do some security checking on that, which is great, but my job as a hardware pen tester is to break it. I need something that works in order to break it, don't I? So there was always a really big lag between the time we got first silicon and the time we got an operating system booting to the time it got working properly. And once it was working properly, that was my turn to go and try and make it not work properly. And the, the, the sooner I tried to do that job, the easier my job was, but the less realistic it was, right? So um, that kind of like, is a, a series of things that really affects where we're going with this. Um, onward, so where are we going? Anybody have any ideas? Uh, yeah, <laughs> everything's fine. Um, that deserves a pin though. What was that? Yeah, oh, good, good dodge. Um, who's heard of guard band? So when you design an integrated circuit, this is uh, from an AT mega or AT tiny uh, data sheet. And they say, okay, here's your safe operating re range. If you give me 1.5, 1.8 volts, then I can run up to four megahertz reliably. If you give me 5.5 volts, I can run up to 20 megahertz reliably. And that's kind of what the manufacturer is promising you when they deliver you this part. In reality, the line looks more like this, right? It's a bumpy line somewhere, hopefully, on the outside of this safe area. And that line is different for every single part they manufacture. But what they do when they manufacture it is they say, okay, well, we, we know we need to work here and we know that this is where the line is. And over time, this line is gonna move in or out based on age, degradation, sunspots, you know, uh, random things. So like, you have this guard band, this, this guard rail that you say, okay, even though we say we work here, we're gonna work up to here. This is where overclocking lives, um, if you were curious. Um, and yes, you can overclock microcontrollers, not just PCs. Um, but security really is guard band, right? We have to be in a place where we have extra functionality, we have extra time in both uh, computation cycles time as well as developer time, as in product development time, to not only make something work, but make it work right so that it can't be unworked by an attacker. Um, and I'm getting close to the end of my stack of slides, which is just right. Um, so looking at mobile devices, this is a really interesting thing, one, because it's hot topic and everything, and we look at performance of mobile devices. And we, this is just the past, uh, a few years, starting from a few years ago, uh, from a baseline of really low all the way to uh, big numbers, whatever. It's like a zero, all, uh, a few hundred, all the way up to over 4,000 uh, Geekbench score points, whatever they are. Um, what's really interesting is this is changing over the course of five years, and we have a lot of improvement. Do you remember the, the, the big chart I showed you from Hennessy and Patterson, where we had huge performance increases of 50% per year, and then it leveled out? Well, this doesn't look like leveling out to you, does it? What I see is I see that mobile devices are stuck, uh, not necessarily stuck in a, in a bad way, but, but they're still living in that realm. They're still taking the gains from that increased performance, and they're still getting the advantages of that increased performance that they didn't have. We have more capacity to put more stuff into mobile devices. We have the ability to make them more secure because we have that extra performance, right? Who had, um, I believe it was a Nexus 6? Uh, you could go and you could uh, enable uh, uh, encryption of the entire uh, root file system, which is great. But then when Google finally shipped, they turned it off, right? Why'd they do it? Performance. Um, the Nexus 5X the same way. People got the Nexus 5X, which was supposed to be a new replacement for the Nexus 5, and it was slower on most benchmarks because the encryption was turned on. And people actually complained about this. Some people. Well, I didn't complain. Um, I'm happy to have full, full, full uh, flash encryption on my phone, but I need this guard band to do it. I need this extra capacity to do it. 
I wouldn't have bothered using a phone in 2009 if it had the performance impact that full encryption would have had at that point in time. Um, we got other changes that are happening. This is from the FCC, and the, it's a little bit squashed because of the resolu resolution of the display. But basically, this is from 2011 to 2014. 2011 to 2014, um, broadband speeds, um, DSL, cable, fiber, and satellite, right? So we can see, like, there's improvements here. Like, we're still advancing in some of these realms. We may not be getting more computing performance, but we're getting more interconnectivity performance, right? The higher levels of that pyramid are still improving. Um, mobile devices have not had a dramatic increase, except this is a logarithmic chart, so it doesn't look the same. Um, where GPRS is displaced by Edge, by UMTS, HSDPA, and now LTE gives us huge amounts of data per second that you know, we'd be amazed to have on our home computers less than 20 years ago, or even like five years ago. Um, so what my conclusions come to is, it's really interesting, it doesn't seem like to me we care about security until two things happen, right? We learn that we don't have security, or we come into a situation where we need it, and number two, we have the capacity to solve it, right? We, no one ever disagreed that full encryption was, a, well, that's not true. Lots of people disagreed that full encryption was never necessary, even outside of law enforcement. Um, but um, no one really thought it was a good idea a while ago. It wasn't until we had the extra performance and capacity and access times of our memory and our flash to actually solve that problem. So we need both the awareness of the problem and the capacity to solve the problem for us to actually advance security. Um, so that's what I see with all these different devices. That's what I see with embedded devices, industrial control systems, um, and IoT devices. They're just a little, they're a few years behind us, and in time, they'll catch up. They're a few years behind desktop and server CPUs, and in time, they'll catch up. They'll get the same capacity. Um, who disagrees? Okay, good. Um, I've succeeded in get you thinking about that. You deserve the Car Hacker's Handbook. Okay, I'm not gonna throw it. You can come up here. And, you know, this is a conclusion, this is not a, a law, this is not a rule, um, and I hope that I can be convinced otherwise if we have a conversation about this. Um, but what's true, though, is the, the bugs of the 90s are alive in firmware, right? Why? Because we don't have the same visibility, um, we don't have the same access to tools, we don't have the same experience and performance that we do on other systems. So even, you know, IoT embedded mobile ICS um, cars, um, and even when you get down to the low levels of a PC, like your BIOS, right, that's just firmware, right? But it's so low level, we don't have the full capacity of a full PC. So um, we've been here before, we've solved these problems before. So I asked at the beginning, what was your first computer? So who, whose first computer was uh, 70s or before? And whose first computer was in the 80s or before? And 90s or before? And this, uh, the noughties or before? Um, it's okay. You, um, uh, and sometimes you think like, oh man, like all those old timers, they have all like, all their like cruft, all their like experiences of how things used to be and they always whine about like, oh, we used to have to do this. And then, you know, on the other side, you're like, oh, those newcomers, they don't know what it's all about. They don't know how hard it was to get here. Um, in all reality, like everything is at a different spot on the spectrum and the problems that we might be solving right now in uh, embedded devices are actually kind of the same problems we might have solved in the 80s and 90s with mainstream computers. So someone who was there then might already have these answers. We don't have to invent them again. Um, so hopefully, you know, you saying when your first computer was here or abstaining if you did not want to kind of makes you think, oh, I should be talking to the people that have a different experience of computing because they're gonna have a different perspective. One really weird example of this, who knows, who's familiar with ROP, Return Oriented Programming? Right? So this is a situation where you, you don't have the ability to make executable code, so you just call bits and pieces of existing executable code. Do you know what they used to call that in the 80s and 70s? Efficient execution. We don't have, we don't have memory to waste, so why are we gonna put this same half of a function in there again? We'll just call it in the middle of it. Um, you know, all these problems are being encountered and found again. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. So you were talking about the computing and the human resource that has to be able to solve these problems. They will become solved problems, just like broadband, like the average person is going to solve them. I don't think they'll just become solved problems. 
I think that with time and effort, we may be lucky enough to do the work to make them solved. We, will, we have situations where we just don't have the capacity to solve the problems now. I think in the near future, we will have the capacity to solve these problems. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I understand, and I can appreciate that, but what I see is that um, we are not even there yet. Like, we haven't solved those problems. I don't know if we have the capacity to solve those problems. Perhaps we do um, have the societal and civilization capacity, but we don't have the individual organization capacity to work together to do that. Um, but when it comes to security, like I, I truly believe that in a lot of IoT devices, we simply do not have the capacity to solve those problems. So in five years, in 10 years, when these devices truly have the capacity to solve those problems, things will be different. Um, and in the meantime, there are gonna be people who figure out bits and pieces of that, and perhaps the, economy, the, the market will, will favor them. Perhaps they won't. The devil's advocate is that the internet human creativity will find a new way to mutate the problem. Absolutely, and I look forward to that. <laughs> and that's part of why I left the top of the pyramid open. Yeah, so, thanks. Thank you. T tip your bartender. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so we're going to leave the live stream up of the main track in Prez Pub. So if you want to hang out there, this this track will be broadcast over there. Uh, the bar is open in Prez Pub as well, so you can redeem your bar tickets, er, your tickets over there for drinks as well. The food, you've gotten about 30 minutes to an hour left to grab another lunch if you want it. We're going to donate it uh, after that. And, uh, oh, yeah, the big announcement. Well, not big, but you know. Uh, there are bands in Prez Pub and Scruffy City tonight. If you have your badge, you'll be able to get in for free. Cool. All right, yeah. All right, let's hear it for Joe again. Cool. Uh, and give us a couple more minutes and we'll set up for the next talk. <laughs>